All right. So that homework's posted. So that's I listed a due date of Thursday, but here's the deal. When you come into class on Thursday, we'll start by talking about this homework, and if you have questions, we can talk about them. And if you have a lot of questions, I may say, okay, go ahead and turn it in on Tuesday. Okay. But if you come in, any questions on the homework, no, then I'm going to collect it and grade it. Okay. So you got two options. You got three options. One, don't have any questions, and I'll collect it and grade it. Not the best option. Two, just prepare a bunch of bogus questions that I think you really spent a lot of time. Probably not a great option either. <laughs> or three, right, work on it between here and Thursday. Try to, to answer it and either figure out how to do it all or have some genuine questions and we can talk about them. Okay, so those, those are three strategies. All right, how'd the lab work out? If you finished it or if you're still working on it. It was long, it was long yeah. Um, it's a lot of, of equations for especially the POS for yeah, the intersection and a big circuit, right? Are they just going to continue to get longer and longer? Or? No. Um, that one is in some ways, parts of that are, are the worst of all of them. Um, but the circuit where you actually implement the traffic light with a yellow light, that's a big circuit. That's kind of inevitable. Um, but it's a lot of repetition in that one. But it's probably a two protoboard circuit for most people. And parts of Lab 4 can feel pretty lengthy. But you're not building a big complex circuit for 4 on paper. You're just going to have some big equations to write out for the lab. And then the circuit's usually not too bad. All right, I'll hand back your homework. I'm going to do that after the break, though, to make sure everybody's here. So I can hopefully get everybody all at once. Um, and we'll talk about Lab 4 after the break. <coughs> OK, I want to do some other stuff beforehand. <coughs> so any other questions, concerns? So we were talking about arithmetic on Thursday. We were baking in our 80 degree room. <laughs> so we talked about subtraction, building a subtractor with an adder, and we talked about ALUs, arithmetic logic units, as a way to do general operations. And I showed you a picture of an ALU, a data sheet with a circuit. And then we talked about transistors to cool down. Um, so I want to pick up a few other topics. Um, I want to talk about a modification to K-maps that we can make, which will be useful in your future labs. It'll help you simplify your circuits even more. Um, and then I want to talk about a few odds and ends, multiplexers, demultiplexers, programmable logic, decoders, a few things like that. These are things that will pop up in other labs and they'll pop up in the homework. Um, and we're going to do that for most of today and Thursday. And then maybe towards the end of Thursday, but definitely next week, we're going to switch to the second part of this course, which is looking at what we call sequential circuits. And these are fundamentally different from the circuits you've been doing so far because they have a memory. They remember things that have happened in the past, and the way they act right now depends in some ways on how they acted in the past. Okay, and this is what a computer is. It's a sequential system. Its behavior depends on its past states. Um, and that's going to be the second big chunk of the course is dealing with sequential circuits. And that's going to take us through probably week seven. And then the last part of the course is going to sort of tie all this together. We're going to talk about programming languages for hardware. Okay, how we can design circuits not by putting wires into a protoboard, but by writing code. And that's sort of the modern way that circuit design is done. Um, when people design a CPU that has a billion or two billion transistors in it, they don't do it by writing truth tables and drawing circuit diagrams. They do it by writing code. Right? So this code is in a language usually called Verilog or, or VHDL. It's a hardware definition language. And it kind of looks like you're writing a computer program, but it's, it's a very different thing underneath that's actually going on. 
but it's it's the way that circuit design is done. And to use these languages efficiently, you need to understand everything that we'll have done up to that point. Truth tables and logic diagrams and Boolean algebra and, and state machines and all this other stuff, right? You need that understanding to be able to use Verilog. But once you have that understanding, we can do everything we're doing much more easily with these modern tools. And so your last two labs will be based on using Verilog and some programmable hardware that we can basically build circuitry just by writing code. So that's a long, longer term view. Um, so let's go back to K-maps. And let me show you how we can optimize our truth tables further. So I'm just going to make a function. function of four variables, and I'll just call the output x, and what am I going to do here? Um, so I've got a few one outputs. But I'm also going to have what we call some don't cares. So this dash is a new concept in a truth table. And this means don't care. Literally, I don't care if your circuit produces a zero in that spot or a one in that spot. And the idea is, for some reason, I never expect the inputs to be 0, 0, 0, 1. So if your circuit produces a 0 here, or your circuit produces a 1 there, it makes no difference to me. So you'll see truth tables sometimes, which have zeros and 1s, but also have these dashes, or maybe there'll be an x sometimes. And it means you're free to implement whatever value you want in those cases. So what does this do to our K-map? It gives us a little more flexibility. So we'll do our standard K-map layout. With the following changes. One, we're going to fill in all the ones from our truth table. So there's a 1, and there's a 1, and there's a 1. I think those are our only 1s. But we're also going to fill in the dashes. OK, so this becomes a dash and a dash. That's our 1. This becomes a 1, a 0, a 1, and a dash. And this becomes a set of dashes. All right, so step one, include dashes in the K-map. Point two, optionally cover the dashes. You're not required to cover them, but you're allowed to cover them. So what does that mean? If it will help you get a better covering of your ones, right, larger rectangles, fewer numbers of rectangles, if it will help you do that by including a dash, go ahead and include the dash. If including a dash will give you a worse layout, more rectangles or smaller rectangles, don't include the dash. It's totally optional. So I could cover all four of these dashes, but there's no reason to. It's going to give me another term in my expression for x. I don't want that.
But this one over here, normally I would just cover it with a one by one. But since I've got some dashes here, I could actually include a two by two to cover this. Why don't you just go like from there to the other side? Get the other one. From here to here? Yeah. That would be even better because I pick up this one. Or I could do this and this up here and pick up this one. Gotcha. So we've got a lot of possibilities. But yeah, let's do what you suggest. Let's definitely pick up this one over here. And I definitely have to get these two ones. What's the best way to do that? Four. Which four? Yeah, let's just do this big skinny four by one. And now we've covered all of our ones. We missed some dashes, but we don't care because they're optional. But we got nice big boxes, right? The larger the rectangle, the smaller the expression that it corresponds to, which means we need less logic to implement this. So what's the expression for this red rectangle that's split up in the first and last column? A, B, bar. So A has got to be a 1, right? B could be a 0 or a 1, so that doesn't matter. C could be a 0 or a 1, that doesn't matter. D has to be a 0, so that is A, D, bar. And then what about the purple box? That's just CD. So now we've got a nice expression, x equals AD bar or CD. Pretty small, easy to implement. Without the don't care, we would have had one rectangle here and one rectangle here. So still two expressions, but each one would have had three inputs. Right, so we have a total of four AND gates instead of two AND gates in this case. Does that make sense? So one of the homework problems is a K-map that includes don't cares. Mm -hmm. What the program name is called, don't cares? Yeah. <laughs> sounds, sounds bogus, but, or informal, but yeah, that's pretty much what they're called. You said three AND gates. Do you mean two AND gates and one one gate? This will be two AND gates and an OR gate. But if you didn't have the don't cares, you'd have a three input AND gate for this and a three input AND gate for this, right? And a three input AND gate usually takes two AND gates to implement for us, because we don't have three input chips. All right, so everything you know about K maps carries over exactly the same. It's just when you have dashes, include them and they're available to help you get a better cover, but they're not required. Alrighty. So let's talk about some different kinds of devices. We know about basic gates, and we talked a little about adders and ALUs, and we said we can go from small scale devices like AND gates, OR gates, to medium scale devices that have, I don't know, 20 or 30 gates inside, do larger things. So a pair of devices we're gonna work with a fair amount are called multiplexers and demultiplexers. In some sense, these are universal. You can build a lot of stuff out of multiplexers and demultiplexers. You can do a lot of things with them. They're kind of weird in some philosophical sense. Um, but let me show you a basic example of a multiplexer. So here's a system diagram view. So there's an input we'll call select. There's a pair of inputs, I'm going to call these in 0 and in 1. And there's an output 
that'll call out. And let me show you a truth table just to document exactly what this does. But we're not going to usually think about these in terms of truth table. We're going to think about them in terms of their functional behavior. But let me show you the truth table anyway. What's going on here? It's just a truth table. Right? Why did I pick these particular output bits? Um, look at the top half of this truth table. How does the output relate to the inputs? Do you notice anything? The output is the same as input zero. Right? Input zero is zero, zero, one, one. That's exactly what the output is. So up here, the output is equal to in zero. What about down here, in this bottom half? Mm -hmm. The output's equal to in one. Zero, one, zero, one. And in this upper half, the select line is equal to zero, and in the lower half, the select line is equal to one. So it's kind of like the function of this block is the select line chooses one of these inputs to get sent to the output. If my select input is zero, this whole block basically takes in zero and connects it to the output. But if I set my select input to one, it basically takes in one and connects that to the output. So it's kind of like a steering network or a railroad switch. We can choose which one of these goes on to the output by controlling whether we set a one or a zero into the select line. And that's really the way to think about multiplexers. They're electrically steerable pathways, conduits, things we can run signals through. Okay, why is that useful? Well, think about a computer and imagine that we have, um, well, I don't know. Suppose we have an adder. We know an adder is a pretty big piece of hardware, right? 32-bit adder, a whole bunch of full adders, XORs things like that. So it's a pretty big chunk of hardware. Inside a computer, what do we want to add? Well, sometimes we want to add a variable's value from memory. Sometimes we might have some internal piece of storage and we want to add something to that. Sometimes we're going to get something from the network and we might want to add a value to that or read something from a file on the hard drive and mm -hmm. add a value to that. Lots of different things we might want to use this adder for. And rather than have an adder that goes with the hard drive, an adder that goes with the main memory, an adder that goes with the network, we have one adder, and here's the input A, but this comes out of a multiplexer. And we could have, I don't know, something coming from a file and something coming from memory and the select line. And now if we want to add something from a file, we set select to zero, and this comes through the multiplexer and goes into our adder. But if we want to add something from memory, we could set select to one, and this input from memory would come out of the multiplexer and go into the adder. So this is a little cartoonish, right? But the idea is we could have a single resource and choose, using logic levels, what we feed into the input of this block. 
and you know it's got another input B, and we could take that from another multiplexer output. And if you look inside the guts of a CPU, it's all multiplexers and demultiplexers. I'll show you a picture later. Okay, so we're, we're talking general ideas here. Um, a way to select multiple sources to feed into something. So a demultiplexer goes the other direction. A demultiplexer would have one input. two outputs and a select line. And we can effectively choose whether this input goes to output 0 or output 1 based on the select value. Bless you. So what does this thing look like as a truth table? Well, if select is 0, we want to copy the input to out 0. So this will be 0, 1. And if the input is 1, we want to copy the input to out 1. And we got to decide what to do in these other cases. And maybe we're just going to say the output that we're not sending anything to will just output a 0. So this might be one way to view a truth table for this. But whatever we decide to do, right, these are just truth tables. We can build these things. We can design them. We can write a sum of products, a product of sum. We can use a K-map. We can draw a circuit diagram. We can build it. There's nothing magic going on inside a MUX or a DMUX. It's just another combinational circuit. But we think of these as a MUX is choosing an input to send to an output. A DMUX is choosing an output to send an input to. Still with me? So let's see some things we can do with this. So let's have a four to one mux. So we've got four inputs, and now we're going to have two select lines. Because we have to choose one of one, two, three, four inputs to send to the output takes two bits to specify four different things. So we have two select lines, and that lets us specify which input we send to the output. And now this goes across the ocean, underwater, and pops up on land and goes into the input of a one to four DMUX. With two select lines. So what happens if we set both of these select lines to 0, 0? And let me, I think the ordering is probably easy to guess, but let's just assume that these are ordered like this. So if I set this select line to 0, 0, which input goes to the output? I0. So I0 is basically connected to this output which goes across this wire <coughs> and comes over here. And which output does that appear on? It appears on output 0. And effectively, I've got a big long wire between input 0 and output 0 going across this transoceanic cable. Now, what happens if I change? my select line to <coughs> zero, 1. So now input 1 is connected to the output of the MUX, goes across here, and over here the input of the MUX goes to output 1. And now I've got input 1 connected to output 1. So what happens by setting the same value on these two select lines, I connect an input here to its corresponding output over here. 
I effectively have four communication channels from this point to this point, even though I only have one piece of wire in between. So this is something called time multiplexing. We basically have a single channel, but we use it for different purposes over time. And if we kept changing these 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, we'd be sharing this one physical wire to communicate among these four channels. And you can mix and match, right? And you can mix and match. If we wanted I0 connected to O3, we could set this to 0, 0, and this to 1, 1, and now that would come over there. So communication networks are built on top of multiplexers. All right, let me show you something else we can do with a MUX. This is possibly the coolest application. So we got four inputs, two select lines, and we have an output. And I could write a truth table for this, but how many inputs do I have? Four. I got more than four. I got four inputs on the left, plus two select inputs. I got six inputs. How many rows in a six input truth table? A lot. A lot. <laughs> so two to the sixth was <laughs> still a lot. <laughs> What's two to the sixth? You can do this. One more. 64. So 64 rows in the truth table, right? There's no reason to write that, though, if we understand the functional behavior of this, which is S is 1 and S is 0, give you a 2-bit number, and it selects one of these four inputs to connect to the output. So I won't write the truth table. We'll just keep that in mind. Suppose I have a function of two inputs and I give you a truth table. I don't know. It's a random truth table. We can do sum of products and K maps and all this kind of stuff and build a circuit. But if we have a multiplexer, we can build a circuit to implement this without any work. Here's how we do it. multiplexer do? If A and B are both 0, the select lines are 0, 0. This multiplexer takes input I0 and sends it to out. Well, I0 is 5 volts. That's a logic 1. My output's going to be 1. If my inputs are 0, 1, this multiplexer takes input 1 and sends it to X. Input 1 is tied to 5 volts. That's a logic 1. X is equal to 1. If my inputs A, B are 1, 0, this takes input 2, which is connected to ground, sends it to X, X is a 0. And if A, B are 1, 1, it takes input 3, which is logic 1, sends it to X, X is a 1. So this implements this. And it's effortless to come up with a design. All I did was I tied my inputs to 1, 1, 0, 1, because that's what the outputs are. And if you have an 8-input or a 16-input multiplexer, you can do this to implement a function of three variables or four variables. And if you had a 10-input multiplexer, you could implement any truth table of 10 variables just by connecting each of your 1,024 inputs high or low according to your truth table. It's a really, really painless way to design circuits. And it's a little creepy, right? 
because somehow it's capturing everything that we've been doing for three weeks with circuit design and it's either using that or throwing it out the window and giving us this very painless way to do the same thing. Is this how AI works? Or is it just way more complicated? It's a similar idea, I think. It's a similar idea. Um, in the sense that we're almost saying that all of this is really just a lookup table. We're really sort of hardwiring what we want this thing to do in different input combinations. And I think that's one aspect of learning, which is an aspect of intelligence, right? And I think intelligence is the ability to take the process of learning and codify that and actually learn how you're learning. So you get this hierarchy of learning on top of learning. That's a whole other topic. <laughs> we could have a lot of fun talking about that. So this, this perhaps begs the question, how do we build a four-input multiplexer? I said it's got a 64-row truth table. We could write that out, and we could do the usual thing to come up with some equations and implement that. But what about a 16-input truth table uh, multiplexer? So 16-to-1 uh, mux. has 16 inputs. How many select lines do we need? Four. Four will do it, because we need to choose one of 16. So two to the fourth is 16. So we have four select lines and 16 input lines. That's a total of 20 inputs. So how very big is that? <laughs> two to the 20th. Fat number. Do you remember what two to the tenth is? So two to the tenth is about a thousand. It's a k. So two to the twentieth is a thousand squared. It's a million rows. Homework? No. <laughs> but it turns out there's easier ways to design multiplexers than writing out the truth table and doing the usual sum of products, et cetera. And that's cool because multiplexers are really powerful. They're powerful for designing circuits. So how are we going to design a big multiplexer? Take a crazy guess. Multiple? Say, say again? Multiple multiplexers? Yes, we're going to use multiplexers to make bigger multiplexers. <coughs> awesome. And this is very easy, too, once you know how to do it. All right, here's a two to one multiplexer. We know how to make that, right? That's not a bad truth table. It looks like this. And these things and these things are going to reduce nicely in a K map. So it's going to be a pretty small expression. So this one we might just build the old-fashioned way. So suppose we have, we have access to a 2 by one multiplexer. Well, get yourself a second one, exactly like the first. And get yourself a third one. Exactly like the first two. And we're going to put all of this inside a box. All right, so we're going to take these inputs. And these are going to be the inputs to our 4 to 1 multiplexer. So we'll call this I0, I1, I2, and I3. And we're going to take this output and feed it to this input, and the same thing here. 
So we're gonna multiplex the outputs of these two multiplexers. And we're going to take these two select lines and tie them together and bring that out. And we're gonna take this line and bring it out. And this is going to be our output. And let me see if I can get the order right because there's a 50% chance I get it wrong here. Um, I think we're going to want to do S0 and S1. And the claim is this green box is a 4 to 1 multiplexer. Okay, so what does this circuitry do? Basically, based on S0, we're going to choose either I0 or I1 to come out here, and either I2 or I3 to come out here. And then based on S1, we're going to choose either the value that came out here or the value that came out there to be the final output of the circuit. So S0 is choosing basically whether we want an even or an odd numbered input, and S1 is choosing, do we want the first one of those or the second one of those? And if you work through all the four possible cases, well, let's just do a couple of them. I suppose this is zero and zero. So this is going to take I2 and send it out here, and this is going to take I0 and send it out. And this zero coming in here will select this input, which is I zero. Your output will be I zero. Now, if we do one zero, this input is a one, so it's going to take I three and send it out here, and it's going to take I one and send it out here. And now this zero will select the input to I zero, which is I one. And so your output will be I1. And you can go through the other two cases and you'll find that in each case this is selecting the appropriate input to send to the output. So if you have a few two to one multiplexers, you can make a four to one multiplexer. And guess where we go from there? All right, you can build it up. So there's a couple of four to ones. Well, there's four four to ones. And they each have two select lines, and you tie all of these together. And you get four outputs from there. And you put those into a final four to one. And you use your other two select lines to choose one of these. And there's your output, and there's a 16 to one. And you can keep building this up, right, more or less indefinitely. So there's a circuit with 20 million rows, uh, a million rows in the truth table. And it fits on a piece of paper. <laughs> All right, so that's, that's Miscellaneous multiplexer magic. Um, so let's leave that for now. The the take home message here is multiplexers are kind of cool. All right, um, they get cooler as you go through computer science and engineering. Um, let's break five minutes and then I want to talk about some programmable logic and then we'll talk about lab four and we'll go over some of the homework and then we'll continue this kind of stuff on Thursday. So the homework is just a bunch of k -Mets. It's mostly a bunch of